<laughs> you know what time it is. Woo! Get it towing! <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain why I'm laughing because I actually started story time literally 30 seconds ago not even that but I didn't have the mic plugged in <laughs> which shows that I'm not working with this full set of marbles I'm not working with a full set of bocce balls I'm sorry y'all how is everybody today on Actually, Wednesday is my favorite day of the week, but what I will say is this. Monday is not one of my favorite days of the week, but I look forward to Mondays. Mondays can be good. It is the beginning of the week. And anything can happen. Which, hopefully everybody snuggled up because it's starting to snow here in Ohio, um, which is rather interesting considering it's December 18th and we should have gotten snow in November, but that's my personal feelings on that. I'm from Cleveland. I grew up with real snow. I'm used to going to school even if it was a foot of snow on the ground. Which is honestly really fun to walk in. Ooh. Ooh, yes. Shout out to my friend Joshua for recommending me this Chinese red ginseng tea. I just started it. I boiled the roots and I can use them a second time. So I'm super excited about that. But... Enough of my blather. We came to hear a story, not my musings of the day. And when we were last here, our band of heroes, Tar and Fluter, and Prince Gwydion, Gurgi, have arrived at King Smoit's castle at Cantreve Kadarn. However, um, if you remember the Castle of Lyra, which is the third book in the series, there was a steward by the name of Mag, and Mag has now become like the right hand man to Death Lord Arorn. And so now he claims that he has incredible powers and that everybody should bow to him and that, you know, he could just call up the evil lord of the land of the dead to just do his bidding. We're going to see how v the validity of his claim in this chapter, okay? Oh, goodness. Before I start, it helped to have my glasses on, right? Because I can't see nothing. <clears throat> and no, I do not own the music that is being played in the background. Chapter 5. The Watcher. Although Fluder Flam quickly let Ailanwe, King Rune, and Glue to Avrin Harbor, their return from the ship was less rapid. First, the King of Mona managed against all likelihood to tumble over his horse's neck when the dappled Grey halted to drink at the riverbank. The ducking th thoroughly soaked the unlikely king, but did not dampen his spirits. However, Rune's sword belt had come undone and the blade had sunk in the shallows. Rune began unable to fish it out again because he had also got himself tangled in the steed's harness, which that's just somebody that's just unfortunately very clumsy, which is me when I was much younger. I was very clumsy. I mean, I still am now, but I would hope that I've grown a lot more common sense. I hope. <laughs> Fluter was obliged to plunge into the river for the weapon. Glue now protested bitterly against riding behind the sopping bard. <clears throat> well then, little weasel, cried Fluter, shivering and beating his arms against his sides. By my choice in the opposite direction. Glue only sniffed haughtily and refused to budge. Ilanwe stamped her foot with impatience. Will you make haste, all of you? We came to look after Lord Gwydion, and we can hardly look after ourselves. The former giant consisted to ride behind the princess on Luagor, and they set out once more. Lion, however, had suddenly taken it into her head to be playful. She lunged forward on her huge padded paws and spun joyfully about while the desperate band clung to her tawny neck. It was all Fluter could do to keep Lion from rolling onto her back with himself astride her. She seldom does this, shouted the breathless bard, while Lion with great leaps circled the companions. She's really been quite well behaved. No use scolding her. Makes no difference. At last, Fluter was forced, with difficulty, to unsling his harp and pluck out a melody until Lion grew calm again. Soon after midday, the bard heard the faint distant notes of Tarn's horn. They're worried over us, Fluter said. I hope we shall soon rejoin them. The companions pressed on as quickly as they could, but the distance between the two bands increased rather dwindled, and at nightfall they wearily halted and slept. 
At first, fresh morning start brought them. According to Fluter's reckoning, less than half a day behind the others, King Rune more than ever agreed to reach Kerkadar and urged all speed from the dappled gray, but the mare's pace was much more slower than Lion and Luagor's. Ilanwe and Fluter continually had to rein in their mounts. Midway through the afternoon, King Rune gave a glad cry. Kerkadar and lay only a little distance off. They saw Smoit's crimson banner clearly beyond the trees. The companions were about to hasten onward, but Ilanwe frowned and looked once more at the fluttering standard. How odd! The princess remarked, I sense King Smoit's jolly old bear, but Gwydion surely must be there by now, and I don't see the banner of the House of Dawn. Queen Teleria taught me it is courtesy for a Cantreve noble to fly the golden sunburst of dawn when one of the royal house visits him. True enough in ordinary circumstances, agreed Fluter, but I doubt at this point that Gwydion wants anyone to know where he is. He's told Smoy to put inside the formalities, a most sensible precaution. Yes, of course, Hylanwe replied. I shouldn't have thought of that. How clever of you, Fluter. The band beamed happily. Hold that thought, ladies and gentlemen. Is that the door? No, I got somebody working next door. Okay. Never mind. You know me, I'm from East Cleveland. Somebody knocking on my door like that. I gotta figure out who it is. <laughs> and thank you. <clears throat> True enough in ordinary circumstances, agreed Fluter, but I doubt at this point that Gwydion wants anyone to know where he is. He's told Smoy to put aside the formalities, a most sensible precaution. Yes, of course, Hylanwe agreed. I shouldn't have thought of that. How clever of you, Fluter. The bard beamed happily. Experience, princess, long experience, but never fear, such wisdom will come to you in time. Even so, Ilanwe said as they rode farther, it's curious the gates are closed. Knowing King Smoit, you might suppose they'd be flung wide open in a guard of honor waiting for us, with King Smoit himself at the head. Fluter waved the girl's remark aside. Not a bit of it. Lord Gwydion follows a path of danger, not a round of festivals. I understand how such things are done, but been, I've been on a thousand secret missions. Ah, uh, well, perhaps one or two. <laughs> He added hastily. I fully expected Kerkadarn would be buckled, bolted, and shut tight as an oyster. Yes, Hylanwe said. I'm sure you'll know more about such things as I. Which, if you haven't caught on, Hylanwe is practicing something that you will learn as you get older, children. It's called sarcasm. <laughs> it's called sarcasm. Because she knows that... She's paying attention to very obvious things. Why are the gates closed? Why aren't the flags put up? These are very customary things that don't need a whole lot of fanfare. That's why it's very important to be vigilant. What does that mean? Vigilant is to be aware of one's surroundings and those around them. To be aware of your space and the situation that you are in. Hence why the term vigilante comes in. Like Batman. He's always aware of everything. For the most part. <laughs> she hesitated, straining her eyes to take in the castle, while the others were now rapidly approaching. But King Smoit isn't at war with his neighbors, as far as I've heard. Two watchmen on the walls would be more than enough. Does he need a whole party of bowmen? Naturally, replied Fluter, to protect Lord Gwydion. But if no one is to know Lord Gwydion's there, Ilanwe persisted. Great Beelern, cried the bard, reining up Lion. Now you make my head spin. Are you trying to say Gwydion is not at Kaer Kadarn? If he's not, we should soon find out. And if he is, will she find that out as well? Fluter scratched his spiky yellow head. But if he's not, then why not? What could have happened? And if he is, then there's nothing to worry about. Yet if he isn't... Oh, dratted blast, you've turned me queasy. I don't understand. I don't understand either, Ilanwe answered. All I know is, I don't even know it. Well, I can't explain. I I see the castle, all crooked-wise. No, not see, taste. No, well, no matter, she bursted out. I've come all over chills and creeps, and I don't like it. You've had experience, I doubt not. 
But my ancestors were enchantresses, every one. So should I have been, if I hadn't chosen to be a young lady. Enchantments! The bard muttered uncomfortably. Stay away from them. Don't meddle it. It's also been my experience. They never turn out well. <laughs> I say, put in Rune, if the princess feels there's something amiss, I'll be glad to ride ahead and find out. I shall frankly rap on the gates, demand to know. Nonsense, replied Fluter. I'm quite sure all is well. A harp string broke and twanged loudly. The bard cleared his throat. <clears> throat> No, I'm not sure at all. Oh, bother it. The girl has put an idea in my head and I can't shake it out. One way, everything looks all right. The other way, it looks all wrong. Just to ease your mind, uh, my mind, that is, Fluter told the princess, I shall be the one to find out. As a wandering bard, I can go and come as I please. If anything's wrong, no one will suspect me. There's no harm done. Stay here. I'll be back directly. We shall laugh over this at King Smoit's table, he added, but without great assurance. The bar dismounted, considering it wiser not to draw attention by riding Lion. And you try no mischief, he warned Glue. I hate to let you out of my sight, but Lion will keep an eye on you. Hers are sharper than mine, and so are her teeth. On foot, the bard made his way to the castle. After a time, Ilanwe saw the gate swing open and Fluter disappear within. Then all was silent. By nightfall, the girl had grown seriously alarmed, for there had been no further sign for the bard. The companions had concealed themselves in a thicket, awaiting Fluter's return. But now Ilanwi rose and anxiously faced the castle. It is all wrong, she cried, taking an impatient stride forward. King Rune drew her back. Perhaps not, he said. Why, he'd have come back immediately to ha warn us if there was. No doubt Smoit's giving him supper, or... Rune loosened his sword in his sheath. I'll go and see. No, you shall not, Ilanwe cried. I should have gone in the first place. Oh, I should have known better than to let myself be put off by anyone. Rune, however, insisted. Ilanwe refused. The heated, although whispered dispute that followed was interrupted by the sudden arrival of the bard himself. Breathless and gasping, he stumbled into the thicket. It's Mag! He has them all! Fluter's voice was pale in his face in the moonlight. Caught! Trapped! <laughs> Ilanwe and Rune listened aghast at what had Fluter had learned. The warriors themselves don't know who the prisoners are, only that they are four with Smoy locked up for treachery. Treachery indeed. They've been made to swallow some kind of tale. The game goes deeper than that. What it is, I couldn't discover. I think the guards had orders to lay hold of everybody entering the castle. Luckily, those orders didn't seem to apply to wandering bards. It's so usual for a bard to drift in and sing for his supper that the warriors never gave it a second thought. Though they did keep an eye on me and wouldn't let me near Smoit's Great Hall or the larder where they put the prisoners. But I caught a glimpse of Mag. Ooh, that sneering, smirking spider. If only I could have run him through then and there. The warriors kept me harping until I thought my fingers would drop off, he hurriedly concluded. Although I should have been back long ago, I didn't dare stop or they'd have smelled a rat. And there's a rat to be smelled, he cried furiously. How should we rescue them? Ilanwe demanded. I don't care why they're locked up. Ask later. First, get them out. We can't, Fluter answered in despair. Impossible. Not with only four of us. And that's four counting Glue, who can't be counted on at all. S Glue snorted. Usually, the little man took no interest in anything not bearing directly on himself. Now his face was agitated. When I was a giant, I could have torn the walls down. Bother when you were a giant, snapped Fluter. You're not one now. Our only hope is to go farther into the cantry, tell one of the cantry lords what's happened, and have him rally an attack for us. It will take too long, cried Ilanwe. Oh, do be quiet and let me think. The girl strode again to the clearing and turned her eyes defiantly toward the castle which flung its own dark defiance against her. Her mind raced but with no clear plan. With half a sob and half a cry of anger she was about to turn away. A movement against a nearby tree caught a glance. She halted a moment, not daring to turn her head. 
From a corner of her eyes, she grew aware of a strange, humped shadow. Motionless now, as if to continue on her path, she walked seemingly in the direction of Fluter and Rune, but edged little by little toward the tree. L suddenly, quick as lion, she leapt upon the humped figure. Part of it went rolling in one direction, and the rest of it set up a muffling shrieking. Alanwe pummeled, kicked, and scratched. Fluter and King Rune were at her side in an instant. The bard seized one end of the flailing shape, King Rune the other. Alanwe drew back and quickly took the bauble from her cloak. As she cupped it in her hand, the sphere began to glow. She held it closer to the struggling form. Her jaw dropped. The golden beams shone on a pale, wrinkled face with a long, drooping nose and a mournful mouth. Wild wisps of cobweb-like hair floated above a pair of eyes that blinked wretchedly and tearfully. Gwistel, Alanwe cried. Gwistel of the fair folk! The bard loosened his grasp. Gwistel sat up, rubbed his skinny arms, then climbed to his feet and pulled his cloak defensively about him. How nice to see you again, he mumbled. A pleasure, believe me. I've thought of you often. Goodbye. Now I really must be on my way. And if you remember Gwistel from The Black Cauldron, he is a very melancholy character. And it was Gwistel that gave Tarn Ka, the crow that he uses to, you know, help him on his missions and gather information. Help us, Ilanwe pleaded. Gwistel, we beg you. Our companions are prisoned in Smoit's castle. Gwistel clapped his hands to his head. His face puckered miserably. Please, please, he moaned. Don't shout. I'm not well. I'm not up to being shouted at this evening. And would you mind not shining that light in my face? No, no, it's really too much. It's more than enough to be pulled down and sat on without people picking on you and bellowing and half-blinding you. As I was saying, yes, it's been delightful running into you. Of course, I'll be glad to help, but perhaps another time... When we're not feeling so upset. Gwistel, don't you understand? I Ludwig cried. Have you been listening to me at all? Another time? You must help us now. Gwydion's sword is stolen. Durnwin is gone. Arorn has it. Don't you see what that means? This is the most terrible thing that could ever happen. How can Gwydion get the sword back if he's locked up? With his own life in danger. And Tarin and Cole and Gurgi. Some days are like that, Gwistel sighed. What's to be done about it? Alas, but n hope things will brighten, which they very likely won't. But there you are. It's all one can do. Yes, I know Durnwin is stolen. A sad misfortune, a disheartening state of affairs. You already knew, exclaimed the bard. Great Beelard, speak up, where is it? No idea whatever, Gwistel gasped in such desperation that Alanwe believed the melancholy creature indeed spoke the truth. But that's the least of my concerns. What's happening around Anuvin? He shuddered and patted his pale forehead with a trembling hand. The huntsmen are gathering. The cauldron board have come out. Whole troops of them. I've never seen so many cauldron board altogether in my life. It's enough to make a decent person take to his bed. And that's not the half of it, Gwistel choked. One of the Cantreve lords are rallying their battle hosts and their war leaders hold council in Anuvin. The place is thick with warriors inside, outside, wherever you look. I was even afraid they'd discover my tunnels and spy holes. These days, I'm the fair folk's only watcher close to Anuvin. More is the pity, for the work piles up so... Uh, believe me, Gwistel hurried on, your friends are better off where they are. Much safer, no matter what's been do done to them. It can't be worse than stumbling into that hornet's nest. If by chance you do see them again, give them all my fondest greetings. I'm sorry, terribly sorry. I can't stay longer. I'm on my way to the realm of the fair folk. King Idolake should learn of these matters without delay. If King Idoleg learns you wouldn't help us, Alanwe indignantly burst out, you'll wish you never left your waypost. It's a long, hard journey, Gwistel sighed and shook his cobwebby head, completely ignoring Alanwe's remark. I shall have to go above ground every step. 
Idleg will want to know all that stirring along the way. I'm not up to journeying, not in my condition, not in this weather, least of all. Summer would have been much more agreeable, but there's nothing to be done about that. Goodbye, farewell, always a pleasure. Gwistel stooped to pick up a bundle almost as large as himself. I Ludwig clutched him by the arm. Oh, no, you don't, she cried. You'll warn King Idleg after we free our companions. Don't try to deceive me, Gwistel of the Fair Folk. You're cleverer than you care to let on. But if you won't give us your help, I know how to get it. I'll squeeze it out of you. The girl made a movement to seize the creature b about his neck. Gwistel gave a heart-ending sob and feeble endeavor to defend himself. No squeezing. No, please. I couldn't face up to it. Not now. Goodbye. Really, this is hardly the moment. Fluter, meanwhile, was staring curiously at the bundle. The large, lumpy pack had rolled near a bush when Nylonway first set upon Gwistel, and it lay partly undone on the ground. Great Balin, murmured the bard. What a tangle of oddments. Worse than a snail with his household on his back. It's nothing, nothing at all, Quistel said hurriedly. A few little comforts to ease the journey. We might do better squeezing this pack instead of Quistel's neck, remarked Fluter, who had dropped to his knees and begun to rummage through the bundle. There might be something here more useful than Quistel himself. Take whatever you please, Quistel urged as Ilanwe turned the bobble's glow upon the heap. Have it all if you like, it makes no difference. I shall manage without it, painfully. But I shall survive. Excuse me. King Rune knelt beside the bard, who thus far had pulled out a few mended sheepskin-lined jackets and several ragged cloaks. Amazing, Rune cried. Here's a bird's nest. Yes, Gwistle sighed. Take it. It's something I've been saving. You never know when the need for one might arise, but it's yours now. No, thank you, muttered the bard. I shouldn't want to deprive you. Their hasty search next revealed water flasks both empty and full, a walking stick in jointed sections allowing it to be folded up, a cushion with an extra bag of feathers, two lengths of rope, a number of iron wedges, and a crooked iron bar, a wide piece of soft leather which, as Gwistel reluctantly explained, could be set about a willow frame to serve as a small boat, several large bunches of dried fruits and herbs, and numerous bags of lichens in all colors. For my condition, Gwistel mumbled, in indicating the latter. The dampness and clamminess around Nuvin is dreadful. Uh, there's, these don't help at all, but they are better than nothing. However, you're welcome. The bard shook his head in despair. Useless rubbish! We might borrow the ropes and fish hooks, but for whatever good they may do us... Gwistel? Alonwe cried angrily. All your tents and boats and walking staves won't answer. Oh, I could squeeze you anyway, for I'm out of patience with you. Be gone, yes, goodbye indeed. Gwistel, heaving huge sighs of relief, rapidly began packing his bundle. As he hoisted it to his shoulder from his cloak, fell a small sack which he tried to desperately to recover. I say, what's this? asked Rune, who had already gathered up the bag and was about to hand it to the agitated creature. Eggs, mumbled Gwistel. Luckily, they weren't smashed when you took your tumble, said Rude cheerfully. Perhaps we'd better take a look, he added, untying the string around the mouth of the bag. Eggs, said Fluter, brightening somewhat. I shouldn't mind eating one or two of them. I've had no food since midday. These warriors kept me harping, but they took no pains to feed me. Come, old fellow, I'm starved enough to crack one now and swallow it raw. No, no, squealed Gwistle, snatching for the bag. Don't do it. They're not eggs. Not eggs at all. I say, they sure look like it, remarked Rune, peering into the sack. If they weren't, then what are they? Gwistle choked. They went to a fit of violent coughing and sighed before he answered. Smoke, he gasped. And that is where we will end for today. All these characters from previous books are all coming together for this final adventure. And I'm very excited to be along for the ride. And also, if you were not aware, there is a new uh, episode of Stuart Little from yesterday. 
Um, I have not yet posted it to the YouTube channel, but it is here free and available for you to watch. And as I always say, you don't have to watch these videos when they go live. You're more than welcome to watch them in your downtime, nap time, max, relax, and chillax in time, in between time, mean time, scheme time, study time, break time, CP time, any time that you want to hear a highly animated voice bring you wonderful stories of magic, fantasy, science fiction, adventure, and many, many more in between. Bye-bye. See ya.